to Zechariah 9, and uh, we have seen that the, in terms of the eschatological setting, from verse 9 on, it uh, is beginning with the first coming of our Lord, his enduring of the cross, and as a result of that, is uh, sending forth uh, his disciples uh, uh, as his ambassadors uh, to uh, plead with the world that they should be reconciled with God, that they uh, should seek the the peace of the covenant. Debeer shalom agreeim. Actually, I see we uh, stopped uh, one line short of finishing verse 10, and uh, the last line then harks back to the theme that we saw in Genesis 49, that the obedience of the amim, the people, the universal uh, recognition of uh, King Messiah. And uh, so it speaks here about his reign, Mashlo, that's, uh, by the way, not a comet, that's a comet satuf under the name, and it represents the, the, the Yuval, the Holom, the, the now would be uh, uh, Moshel. So it's a noun. His reign extends miyam ad yam, sea to sea, u minahar ad arts, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Two possibilities. One is, again, sort of prophetic idiom that's using the uh, Old Testament kingdom of Canaan with its particular boundaries in order to depict the, the whole cosmos over which Messiah reigns, in which case from sea to sea uh, would be from the, the great sea, the uh, Mediterranean to um, uh, the, the Dead Sea, and uh, from the river unto the ends of the earth, uh, uh, it could be taking it and then instead of the east to west the dimension north south of the river being the river Euphrates and the ends of the earth uh, would, would be the, the southern extent of the land so it could be a description of the boundaries of, of uh, in Canaan or it, it could be that this language should be understood more indefinitely uh, so that Messiah's reign will extend from one sea to the other sea the utmost seas and, uh, and uh, from the, the north to the very ends of the, the earth more broadly. E- either way, whether as prophetic idiom or something uh, more literal, uh, the, the thought is certainly that of the universal extent of the Messiah's reign. And now verse 11, I, I also then want to underscore is tying in with our whole discussion of, of the donkey and the blood of the covenant and uh, here we do, I think, have some strong indication that that is what we should see back in Genesis 49 was that covenant ratification donkey because it says now as, as the prophetic address addresses the, the, the people of, of God. Now, now indeed, as, as for you, what, what are the implications of all of, of uh, this for you? Well, as for you, bidam take. Hmm? because of the blood of the covenant. So there's the precise thought that we uh, found in Genesis 49 in that donkey, the blood of the covenant, and uh, here it's referred to. And so as for you, it is by reason of the blood of the covenant, because Messiah has shed the the covenant ratifying blood, that there is a message of deliverance for you. So as for you, because of the blood of the covenant, send forth, uh, or I I send forth, God speaking. He honors the, the, what his son has done, and uh, he sends forth the, your prisoners, Mibor, from the pit, Ain Mayim Bo, in which there was no water. So the people of God in, the, in the, their own sinful plight are described as the, those who are in a waterless pit and perishing sort of Joseph style. Huh? And, uh, but now there, there is deliverance from the, the waterless pit. And the call goes out, therefore, being delivered now from the pit to the stronghold, to Zion. And so they, they are exhorted now. Return, Shuvu, Bitsaron, return to the stronghold now. And they are addressed as those who, who in themselves are the Asire Hatikva, uh, the prisoners, but uh, the, they are prisoners of, of Tikva, which, which is hope. Uh, uh, the, the, there is for God's people a, a, a future hmm, beyond beyond the judgment for the remnant. There is the new covenant. There is a tikva. There is hope. So uh, they are prisoners in themselves, but with, with uh, the hope now here in the gospel. So uh, return to the stronghold. 
uh, because today, Magid, the first person <coughs> pronoun is God speaking, so you have to sort of supply that he is the subject of uh, Magid, the Hifiel participle from uh, God making known. Even today, I, uh, I, supply, I am making known to you <coughs> what I'm going to do, namely, Mishnah Ashiv Lak. I'm going to return double uh, 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 unto you. So perhaps the thought here is equivalent to the Pauline that we should uh, not consider too highly our present uh, afflictions, which are uh, not much compared to the incomparable weight of glory which uh, uh, awaits us. So whatever uh, have been your uh, afflictions, I am now promising, says God, uh, that uh, I, I will work restoration for you on such a grand scale uh, that uh, I will return double to you. Now then, verse 13 takes us back to where verses 1 through 8 were with the thought of conquest. So we've had the thought of the uh, church age, gospel preaching age, and yet here are the people of God during this uh, age uh, as having to endure patiently the, the affliction of the world and, and yet with the hope that that judgment day is coming. And whereas it had said the chariot I remove and the, the battle bow and everything from the midst of you, now once again a, a, a total armament policy. has been total disarmament, speaking peace, and now once again uh, that there is a, an equipping of God's people with all of, of the armament. It goes beyond equipping them with the weapons of war uh, to the startling thought that God is going to change his people themselves into the weapons of war uh, against uh, the enemy. So we read then uh, verse 13, please, in your text. Ki tarak ti li Yehuda. Darak, having here the, well, Darak would mean to tread upon, to walk, but here to tread in the sense that it's a picture of someone with a bow and, and stringing the bow and, and fitting it with the arrow, you would, you would step on the one end of it. And so he said, uh, I, I will, um, what be the right word for that, uh, for the bow, um, tread? Uh, for me, uh, String. String. String, all right. Uh, for, for the Judah. So the thought is that Judah is going to uh, uh, serve as the bow. Now, we don't get the full thought with the word keshet bow until the next clause. So the action of the verb darak, for me, Judah, and then the, the identification of, of the bow comes up in the second clause. And the bow I will fill with Ephraim. So Judah is going to be the bow. Nephrim is going to be the arrow, and uh, changed into the weapons of war, and then it goes on continuing the thought, the, the, the battle of uh, bow and arrow, and also the sword. They're going to be changed into uh, the sword, and I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and so in this perspective, uh, in terms of Old Testament history, the there would ultimately be the rising up of what in, in Daniel's four world empires would be the third one, which would be Greece, which would be coming from, uh, from uh, the West to dominate the people of God. And so they stand here, Greece stands uh, here in, in, in terms of, uh, of a, an ultimate world hostile to God's people. And I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and now from the verb seem, we have the form samtika, uh, I will set you, I will make you, kecherev gibor, more military language. The cherev, of course, is the sword. The gibor is the warrior, the mighty one, the hero. So God's people are gonna be changed into, into bows and arrows and, and, and uh, swords of uh, warriors and God will wield them uh, against the, the enemy. But it's a, an upper register, lower register situation here uh, where God's people are, are pictured on, on earth below conducting the battle, but they're not alone. And uh, the Lord is shielding them from above. He is waging war uh, from above. And uh, 
in, in our whole discussion elsewhere of upper lower register realities and, and the Near Eastern background uh, uh, for it. Uh, we have made mention from time to time, I think, of the way in which the, the, the Assyrian uh, uh, stone <coughs> engravings, they, they would picture an upper register and a lower register, where on the lower register you have the, the Assyrian king doing this sort of thing. He's going riding off to battle with his uh, bows and arrows and, and they're all strong and, 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 and ready to uh, shoot. And then the god Ashur is pictured in the upper register in exactly the same uh, uh, stance, also going uh, forth to, to, uh, to, to battle. And uh, that was the concept that the, uh, the gods were fighting the battles uh, with and, and, and for the, the Assyrian uh, king. And also pictured them coming back in peace, uh, again with, with the posture of the, of the king below duplicated uh, in the posture of the king above, or put it the other way around. So, so here is that thought that is, Israel is going forth uh, to battle, but the Lord is, is uh, whether seen or, or not normally, is uh, fighting for them, and that's the thought here. So above them is, is a Yahweh, and Yahweh Alehem above them, and on this occasion he will be seen. It will, uh, this is the final judgment day, parousia. <laughs> The, the upper register dissolves, the whole distinction between upper and lower register dissolves. We now can see into the glory <coughs> sphere. What verse I'm on verse, um, did I skip some? No. I'm on verse 14. Okay. Verse 14, and Yahweh <coughs> above them will be seen. And we get a typical sort of storm theophany, the portrayal of God the warrior going forth in his glory chariot, uh, which is uh, the glory is not just the temple as a static piece of architecture, but the, the glory uh, then becomes a vehicle on which he rides forth uh, on the, the, the wings of the cherubim to, to battle like a storm cloud. And so there goes <coughs> forth Barak, uh, uh, like the lightning, his arrows. So he too has his bow and arrow, and, and, and his arrow shafts are going forth uh, uh, like bolts of, of lightning. and. Uh, accompanied by the thunder here described in terms of Adonai, Yahweh, upon the shofar trumpet will sound. Yes, he will proceed, he will advance uh, as the, the storms of the south, the particularly the violent uh, storms apparently. And uh, this is the nature of God's going forth uh, to, to battle. And so there's the glory, and we, we've had the sufferings then the blood of the covenant, the sufferings, and now beyond the sufferings is the glory of, of, of the final victory. And along with the glory of the final victory, there is then paradise restored, uh, that, that kind of thing, which is perhaps what was at the end of Genesis 49, uh, the, the, the whiteness of, of teeth from milk, the darkness of eyes from uh, wine. And uh, here the thought uh, is that the uh, uh, but j just before it gets there, it picks up again on the thought of uh, God's people themselves as, as being the very weapons uh, of war that God wields, and it maybe takes it a step beyond that. And it, it, de it describes God's people not merely as the weapons of war, uh, but as if they were fierce animals, mm -hmm. uh, leaping upon the, the prey and devouring them, drinking the blood. It's about as as, as gruesome and startling a, a picture of, of intrusion <laughs> ethics, only it won't be intrusive at that point, it will be final judgment as, as you would have anywhere in, in, in the Bible. God's people are pictured like wild, wild beasts, but that's the imagery that you have here. And um, verse 15. The Lord of hosts, Yagain Alehem, well here's more of the, the upper register thought, the Lord is like a shield above them, protecting them. They have air cover. Air cover, very important in modern warfare. <coughs> okay, then they've got the whole uh, air cover in their half, which is the Lord shielding uh, above them. And as for them, down on the lower register, down on earth, they devour and they trample upon the sling stones. So they're like an animal, and the enemy's trying to overcome them by slinging stones at them. But it, uh, the sling stones get nowhere with them. They just trample upon uh, the sling stones, these wild beast people of God. And 
they drink shata tu, and they roar as with wine, and so they they are pictured as becoming drunk uh, with the blood of, of uh, their their enemies. So they devour them, and they drink and they roar over them as uh, with wine. They are filled. They are gorged with the the the, the body and blood of their enemies. Uh, they are like a bowl, literally like the corners of the altar, perhaps like uh, the bowls that uh, that sprinkle the corners of uh, the altar, the, the the cultic bowls that held the blood that then would be dashed upon the corners of, of the altar. And then summing it all up in verse 16, Yahweh, their God, Hoshia, will save them. Mm -hmm. So the Messiah is the one who was saved, and uh, now because he is Nosha, the, the, the saved one, uh, here there can be the, the, the saving activity of God for his people, and the Yahweh, their God, will, will save them. And uh, here you see salvation is in terms of, of deliverance, too, from their enemies, the, the ultimate the ultimate eschatological theme is the final battle of Armageddon, the, the besieging of the beloved camp uh, uh, by Gog and Magog and so on. In that hour, uh, God saves his people and he will save them in that day. And now you have the introduction here in Zechariah of the shepherd and the flock motif. He will save them in that day. Ketsion Amo, as a flock, his people, that's where he is the good shepherd and, and they are his uh, flock, his people are his flock. And he will save them as a flock, his people, for now again describing the glory of his people. They are described as being Avne, Natser, the stones of a crown, mm -hmm. a, a, a royal crown with its gems, and uh, that's the way they uh, will be. Myth notes a sot, which I would take as a denominative uh, from the noun nates which means uh, the, a, a, a crown and so they will be like the stones of a crown which is lifted up banner like above his land and their glory is then further described at the closing verse verse 17 in terms of of the, the natural prosperity of of an earthly paradise for how great is his goodness and i think the references to the people here the phenomenal suffix how great so you could translate their goodness, how great their beauty when, when God glorifies them. And uh, in a day when, when grain will, the verb is uh, winnow, bave, which means to make to flourish. Grain will make to flourish the uh, bakarim, the young men, <coughs> and, and tea roche, wine, will make to flourish and bit to the, the maidens. So uh, the, there's a picture then of the, the final glory of the people of Messiah as he shares his glory and his victory uh, uh, with them. But the whole passage then in Zechariah 9, I think, is uh, one that's very helpful in looking back in the light of it to understand the, the promise of the Shiloh figure back in Genesis 49, uh, verse 10. Now that, I think, may suffice for our uh, survey of Messianic prophecy and book of Genesis and to what we'll be doing next now for a while is to take some examples from 8th century prophets, uh, first Hosea in the north and then Isaiah in the south. The examples of what we try to analyze in detail as being the nature and, uh, and the function of the prophets and especially the conducting of the lawsuit. And so in Hosea we find a particularly interesting uh, one in terms of the whole <coughs> marriage experience of uh, Hosea, uh, which was uh, set up precisely to convey the message of God's uh, covenant relationship in his lawsuit uh, with Israel. And some of you were halfway out the door when, I, uh, when we were making this announcement that, that in terms of the exam then tomorrow, uh, you know, up to what we just finished is, would be uh, part of your responsibility for the test tomorrow. And uh, what we start on now, the Hosea business, uh, will keep for the final exam. So now you want to turn to Hosea. And let's see, any, any bother to mention the final uh, the midterm tomorrow. Uh, you're, you're all then aware, I trust, then that one question it will, will be to give the sort of uh, a critical survey of interpretations of the Evan Yahweh and the uh, 
Book of Isaiah, all right? So you'll survey the views and, and in, in, include some uh, critical handling of it with perhaps some positive exposition of, of uh, uh, what you think to be the proper view and uh, for which purpose, the latter purpose, uh, Gordon Hugenberger's uh, article would be, I think, very helpful uh, to you. So that would be one of the questions. It would be a two-hour exam, and uh, that, w that that question itself could easily uh, take the better part of an hour, but there'll probably be two other, I, if I say I haven't made it out there, but there'll probably be two other questions uh, to occupy you the, the second hour. <laughs> and it would be uh, possible that you could be asked to translate uh, uh, as well as to, uh, to explain some passages uh, that uh, would uh, be in uh, either or both of those questions. All right. uh, you can use English uh, Bibles uh, for your treatment of anything except passages where actually uh, were part of your required reading and dealing with, with the latter than uh, the only the, the Hebrew text that you should use. Okay. Uh, do I hear groans or sighs? <laughs> <laughs> so, so these other two questions we'll go do in 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Either that, uh, it, it might be better to try to finish up the, the one on the servant of the Lord in something like uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see how it turns out and use some good judgment. <laughs> All right, okay, Hosea, Hosea, 8th century, northern kingdom, and the opening verse sets the scene of his reign in the, the terms of the kings of both Judah and Israel, and then the, the second verse uh, reads, the, the beginning of the Lord spoke by, by Hosea. <coughs> Literally, it's, it's a, an unusual grammatical construction. It's a, a construct noun followed by a, a, not by an infinitive as you would expect, but by the finite uh, verb form, uh, deber. So that's why my odd translation, the beginning of, he spoke. Mm. It says, it says uh, unusual in the Hebrew, so that would be in, in English, the beginning of, he spoke. Uh, you'd expect to be, an, to be an infinitive of the, uh, the beginning of his speaking, the beginning of his speaking. But it, however, this is not the, the only case of that, even if it is rare, and the meaning is plain enough. When the Lord now then undertakes his uh, revelation and mission through Hosea, it began with this uh, strange command that the Lord said unto Hosea, Lake Kaklaka Eshet Zenunim, go and marry a woman of whoredoms. And Moreover, Yaldes in Onim, children of whoredoms, uh, take to yourself in connection with this marriage. And why are you to do that, Hosea? Because, Hosea, you and your marriage are to e exhibit what has been going on between myself, the Lord, and, and my people, Israel, who are acting the way this wife of yours is going to act for Zano Tizneh Haaretz because the land, and the land is used, of course, for the people of the land, the land is committing whoredom, meahare Yahweh, from after the Lord. So there the whole situation is, is before us now, with this, uh, this symbolic relationship between Hosea's uh, marriage experience and the Lord's marriage uh, and, and to his uh, people Israel. Now one of the things we uh, have been doing all along is showing how what the prophets do is rooted in what Moses did, what they are is a uh, reflecting the, the Moses paradigm. And uh, now we come to a passage in uh, which uh, we, we find some imagery of uh, God's people being guilty of uh, boredom against uh, the Lord and uh, with uh, language of, um, of jealousy and of uh, vengeance and so on. And uh, let's look back and see the, the source of, of a lot of this in Moses and especially in that Deuteronomic treaty again that we've seen, seen <coughs> is so rich a source for later prophetic material about the new covenant and so on. 
But if you uh, would turn with me, please, in Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31 and uh, verse 16, following a few verses. Then we'll also be looking at a couple of verses in uh, Deuteronomy 32. The question is going to come up, of course, when we uh, deal with the question of Hosea's marriage as to what kind of a woman is then was she at the point of the marriage? And uh, it's all the patient synonym of woman of boredom, and the children are called uh, Yahweh synonym. Is the thought that uh, uh, here is a woman who's already been uh, guilty of, of a loose life, and in fact she already has the children as a result of these uh, relationships. And uh, nevertheless, Hosea now is going to take this woman already involved in all of this and, and marry her. Is, is that the picture? It, it, and of course, if it is, then that has created difficulty in the mind. So the, the exegetes through the years, and they've come up with uh, other ways to try to avoid the, the force of the moral problem that they think is involved in, in, in that. And uh, so you get different notions that the whole thing is some allegory or it's a vision. And, and, um, but I don't think you'd avoid the whatever. If there's a moral problem, I don't think making it an allegory or a vision Hell helps you any uh, anyway, uh, and uh, but I don't think actually that is what is uh, in view in the first place. That the woman was already involved in all of this, and that the children are already on the scene and the scene, and that he takes this ready-made family uh, with this uh, uh, unhappy character to it. I, I think rather the, the point is that he is to duplicate what the Lord did back here in the days of Moses when he was in the first place making a covenant with Israel. And this is before Israel has then gone its way and, and, and broken their marriage covenant with the Lord in various ways. Uh, it's uh, and not, of course, that they were uh, a sinless people at this point, but in terms of, of, of the biblical imagery here and there in Jeremiah and elsewhere, we get the thought that right here at the beginning when the covenant is first made, that they are looked upon as... Uh, not already engaged in harlotry. It's as if there were a state of, of, of innocence and, 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 a, and a pure commitment that is made, however short-lived it was going to be. But that's the point, how, how, how very short-lived it, it, it turned out to be. And God knew it beforehand. Huh? And that's what we're going to be reading here. As God speaks to, to Moses and tells Moses, now arrange this marriage between myself and, and, and my people. Arrange it. I will marry them. And yet I know what is in their heart. I know uh, how soon they will depart. You'll hardly be dead and gone, Moses, and already that they will be breaking the marriage covenant. Nevertheless, I will marry them. And uh, that's what's being duplicated, in, in, uh, as I see it in the case of uh, Hosea. Here is this woman. She's not yet involved in all of this. But uh, marry her, Hosea. And I tell you beforehand, uh, her propensities are going to be in this uh, direction of zinunim, of boredom, and, and that that will be your unhappy, tragic experience with her, that she will turn out to be. But marry her anyway. Marry her at this point, knowing what she's going to be, because, Hosea, I want your experience to be reflecting mine, and that's what I did. Hmm? I, I took this people, it's an act of, of grace, huh? And, and married them full well knowing how they were going to... Uh, now. now that, I think, is uh, what emerges uh, from uh, Deuteronomy 31 and, and 32. So let's uh, look at this. Uh, 31, verse 16 and following. Well, Yomer Yavi al Moshe, all right, so it speaks to Moses. In a cob, behold, this is not necessarily what Moses wanted to hear, but he's being told this is the last day of your life. So, uh, behold, you are about to fly down with your fathers, of course, to die and be buried with your fathers, and 
Kam Ha'am Hazeh, and and this people with whom you are engaged now, calling them to their marriage vows with, with me and uh, this covenant ceremony. Hmm? And th this uh, people will rise up with Zana. Now there's your uh, language of prostitution and harlotry, and, and uh, she will commit prostitution after foreign gods, the gods of the foreign land, which pronoun who is singular, referring however collectively to the people, so we'll translate they, which they are entering into the midst of them, and uh, what they will be doing will be to abandon me. So you have the verb azab, huh? and they will abandon me. And then that verb hey pair, which uh, you had some examples of, I guess, in the, the, the test, uh, where was it, Jeremiah 31, I guess, parer, to break a covenant, hip field form. And uh, they will break the my covenant, my marriage covenant, which karate ito, which I have uh, am, am making with them. So the, there's the, the basic uh, thought. Okay, you, Moses, you're about to die. You've mediated this covenant. So you've arranged the, the marriage. But very quickly, they, they're going to show their true unhappy colors. And verse 17, my anger then will be kindled in that, against them in that day. And uh, now we get sort of the, the lex talionis. Uh, uh, they will abandon me and I will abandon them. Hmm? We have the same verb now, Azab. They will abandon me and now Azab team and I will abandon them. And uh, explaining that further, we have this verb histarti with the object panai, my face, from them. I will do something with my face from them. Two options. One is that uh, his tar T is from the hollow verb, the I involved verb, sur, and the ta would be what is called an infixed T, and that would mean to turn. So the thought translation would be, and I will turn aside my face from them. The other possibility is that the root is not sur, but sathers, and uh, that's and sather, which means to hide. So uh, it's, uh, in that case, and I will hide my face from them rather than looking at upon them and providing for them and so on. So I will abandon them and I will either turn aside or hide my face uh, from them. And the result will be now when, when God ceases to uh, uh, assume a favoring, fostering attitude uh, toward this people, uh, the, they will be to their own resources, uh, and then they will be helpless. And the, the result is, it shall become, they shall become literally for devouring. They shall become food, they shall be devoured uh, by others. And then the verb matzah is used to find or to overtake, and the subject is raot, rabot, and zarot. Many evils and zarot troubles, many evils and, and troubles then will find them or overtake them all of the curses of the covenant that have been uh, uh, cited in the preceding chapters will, will, will be realized uh, for them. And uh, then they will say in, in that day, when, when all of this has happened, so it would be like uh, in the preceding chapter we studied uh, Deuteronomy 30, when all of these evils have come upon you, uh, then you'll, you'll sort of come to your senses and uh, you'll, you'll know why. So something like that. They then. Uh, uh, they will say in that day, is it not that, ha, lo, is it not that uh, my God is not in my midst? Isn't that the reason why all these evils have uh, overtaken me? And well, let's read one more verse here, verse uh, 18. And uh, God repeating his threat now. And uh, <coughs> I, haster, astir, haster, astir, both the the same root, and the first is an infinitive absolute, which uh, underscores the finite verb. I will indeed then, and either hide or turn my uh, aside my face in the, uh, in uh, in that day, and uh, all this evil then be because of all of the evil which they have done. So that they will commit adultery, and uh, that therefore he will punish them because of all the evil which they have done, for indeed they will turn unto other gods. 
Now this thought of, of God's awareness and, and, and Moses, because God tells him Moses' awareness of what Israel is, is about to do comes out in uh, some other verses. I don't know which the, the main ones uh, might be. Um, let's uh, maybe try around verse 27 might be coming to the point. Uh, let's look at verse 27. Kiano Ki. For I know their, their re rebellion and, and their, uh, how stiff-necked they are. And Hain uh, Beodenu, behold, while he is yet alive in the midst of you this day, you are, uh, you are rebelling against the Lord. And how much more after I am dead? So Moses is saying to them, even, even already today while I'm with you, you're exhibiting this, this, uh, this stiff-hearted view, and how much more are you about to do it as soon as I'm dead and gone and no longer putting uh, a pressure uh, upon you? For uh, another, same, verse 29 he repeats the thought, for I know, Moses tells them, I know that after both T, after my death, that Again, another infinitive absolute that corrupting you will corrupt your way and you will turn aside from the way which the Lord has commanded you. So there's, there's the most intense, clear awareness of where things were going to go right after the honeymoon or even before the honeymoon was, was, uh, was over. Now that's the background. And, uh, and then for some of the language also of the, the whoredom and, and the... Uh, provoking to jealousy and, and so on. Let's look at chapter 32, just a couple of verses, verses 20 and 21. So to see that not only the, the thought, but the language uh, of Hosea's uh, prophecy is uh, derived pretty much uh, here from Moses. Chapter 32, verses 20 and 21. Verse 20, and I said, here is that verb again, I will uh, hide my face from them, let's say, and then I will see what will be Aharitam, what will be their latter end. For they are a perverse generation. They are children in whom there is no fidelity, no faithfulness, no trustworthiness. Verse 21, behold, now you get the verb kana. They will provoke me to jealousy. They will provoke me to jealousy below ale. With literally a not God. Hmm? with idols who are called gods, but which are really not gods, they are low. And, and with such, they are gonna provoke me to jealousy. They will provoke me to jealousy below ale. Now again, you had that lex talionis, they will azav abandon me, and uh, I will azav abandon them. Uh, here it's the verb kana. Uh, the, the, they will provoke me to jealousy with their no gods, uh, yes, and, and uh, they will provoke me with their vanities, another term for idol, and in next Talionis reaction to that, I will provoke them to jealousy. They provoke me to jealousy with a low ale, I'll provoke them to jealousy with a low am. They think they're wonderful people and uh, I'll provoke them with something that is no people at all. It's, it's marvelous that you are the covenant people uh, and these others are not covenant people, they don't qualify, but I'll use those non-covenant people now uh, to provoke you to, to jealousy. And uh, so here, of course, is uh, then the, the prediction of the coming of the Gentiles, the, the Loam people who will be uh, brought into the kingdom and, and uh, whom, whom God will use to stir up uh, his own people to jealousy. So the, the, the thought's gonna move in all kinds of directions, and as you can see at once, and, and how this is picked up in, in, in Paul and his whole analysis of of uh, the way this works out, this provoking of Israel to jealousy and, and uh, so on. Uh, but the, that's the way indeed Paul interprets this passage. That's the, the way Peter interprets this, this passage. We'll be taking a look in a second here at Romans 9, 24, 25, 26, and at 1 Peter uh, 2, 10, uh, to see that they interpret this language in terms of the coming in of the Gentiles. But coming back here to verse 21, that I will provoke them to jealousy with a not people, with a 
foolish nation, wisdom is a is a seen to be an attribute of the, of the people of the covenant because uh, as Deuteronomy 4 has explained what wisdom is. Israel, you have you have the covenant revelation, you have the covenant stipulations, and that's real wisdom. And without that revelation of, of God, to, to be devoid of that is, is to be a, a foolish people. And the other nations do not have the, the covenant disclosure. Uh, they are not a people, but they are not all. They, they are a foolish people, but I will use them in, in order uh, to provoke you. So th that's the, the, the rootage of, of the thought, as I say, and also of some of the basic terminology of the Hosea passage. And now, as I just mentioned, uh, as a, for hum hermeneutical direction, on what the Deuteronomy is all about and, and <coughs> the, the Hosea uh, is uh, all about as he repeats uh, Deuteronomy. And there are those passages then. Let's uh, just quickly turn to Romans 9, verses 24, 25, and 26, where Paul's dealing with the whole question then of, of, of Israel and, and weaves into it the notion that, uh, uh, that they have fallen and yet their fall is so transpired that it's the occasion for the coming in of the no people, <laughs> the, the foolish people, the Gentiles. And as a result of this, however, uh, God will be provoking his elect from Israel uh, to jealousy and, and back to faith. So <coughs> Romans 9, 24. Uh, what if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, as he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And here, of course, is where Hosea is repeating Moses. I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, that uh, they will be called sons of the living God. And um, likewise, then, in First Peter 2, 10, you're familiar with the passage where he, too, uses that language of not my people and so on in, in order to describe uh, the, the Christian community in particular, the, the, uh, the, the Gentiles. So uh, here again, uh, as in our appeal to Romans 10, to get some hermeneutical direction in our interpretation of Deuteronomy 30, uh, we can appeal to Romans 9 to get uh, some direction on Deuteronomy 31, 32, and, and uh, on uh, uh, Hosea. Well, then let's uh, get back in Hosea now. And uh, <coughs> here is that opening situation where he's told to, to take this wife. And that's also the mention of the Yahweh Sunanim, the, the children of Hordoms. And I've already told you then what I, I, I think is the significance of that, what was the nature of this, of this woman. No, she had not already been guilty of prostitution, whether as a street prostitute or a cultic prostitute. Uh, she, she hadn't actually done, done that, but uh, the Lord knows well enough uh, what's in Gomer's heart. Gomer is her name. And uh, therefore, he calls her beforehand that which she is going to uh, um, become. And uh, now, as for the uh, problem, suppose uh, you took another view of it. Suppose she had already uh, been a harlot, and uh, is there something specific in the Mosaic legislation that would forbid, in any case, uh, uh, an Israelite uh, man from taking uh, to wife someone who had been a harlot? Now, a priest was forbidden to do that, uh, but I don't know that there's anything that would rule that out, and in particular, I would assume that the thought was that if she had been a harlot, well, let's take Rahab, huh? And uh, then she marries into the, the covenant community, that there would have been a, a, a change of heart and, and ways before before she does that, because I would uh, assume that the general principle of, of marrying in the Lord, at least, would obtain as a, an Old Testament principle as well as a New Testament uh, principle. But assuming that, uh, then uh, I don't think that the, the, that harlotry passed would would disqualify her completely for being taken as a as a as a wife. Now there may be some other kinds of of uh, contradictions or conflicts with mosaic legislation, particularly the 
the uh, law about uh, taking back as a wife someone whom you have divorced and she has remarried and so on. And uh, th that we will have to face uh, before we're done here as, as a question of whether, especially when we come to Hosea 3, hmm? Hosea 1, he takes this wife along the way there is a, some sort of a separation that takes place and the question we may have to deal with is, is there an actual divorce that takes place? And if so, then when we come to Hosea 3, uh, is there any violation of the, that Deuteronomic prescription against taking back a divorced wife who is meanwhile remarried in, in Hosea's remarrying Gomer? Assuming, as uh, I, I do, that in <coughs> Hosea 3, it is the same woman uh, that is in you and Romans uh, in, in Hosea 1 that's a view in, in the reunion that takes place there. And I don't think there's any question about it, uh, that it has to be the, the same uh, woman there. And uh, the, that um, okay, we'll discuss it when we, we, we get to it. So that there might be a, a problem there of conflict uh, that we have to solve one way or, or the, the other. But uh, now, let's see here. Well, I was just about to put an outline of the uh, of the, the three cycles, the, the thing in, in the, the three chapters that will deal with correspond pretty much to three cycles of the lawsuit. And that's this is a lawsuit deal that we'll see. In fact, in the second chapter, you already get the, the exact language of the reviews to describe what's going on here. And uh, as you go through this lawsuit three times, each time there are three sections A, B, C, in each of the three cycles. and uh, the uh, first two deal with with the breaking of the old covenant. Section A the, is the indictment, and then <coughs> section B is is the judgment, and then the the third section in each of the cycles, which in some cases comes rather abruptly on the, the on, uh, into the picture. The third is the new covenant, huh? beyond uh, the the whole Old Testament lawsuit and the fall of Israel and everything. Then comes the fullness uh, under the uh, under the new covenant, and one of the things that we will have an eye on as we deal with this in that third section, three three passages, each setting forth the, the new covenant, uh, is just the way the new covenant realities are described in terms of old covenant reality, prophetic idiom, and, uh, and it's a it's a good test case for uh, testing one's hermeneutic as to whether we are bound to. Uh, uh, to accept the concept of typological hermeneutic prophetic idiom the way I do, or, uh, or, or whether one should follow, and the answer, of course, is no, you shouldn't follow the, the literalist dispensationalist uh, treatment of those passages. But let's uh, stop now and start studying for a test tomorrow. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm.